United Nations heroes arrive in New York to help launch a nationwide drive for the sale of war bonds. Up Broadway, men of England's RAF, men of America's Navy, men who have met their enemies and defeated them respond to the cheers of New York's millions. Eager for a glimpse of the men they've read about, enthusiastic thousands gather in City Hall Plaza. The triumphal procession roars its way uptown. In its most uproarious reception of the war, New York pays tribute to fighting men of the United Nations. Training motorcycle dispatch riders for the U.S. Army, one of the toughest, most grueling courses in the service. After six weeks of basic instruction, they send them on cross-country trips like this. A terrific test for men and machines, they take the bumps in high gear. Now they're real veterans of the saddle. mightiest bomber plant is rolling. Henry Ford welcomes British and U.S. war supply heads Oliver Littleton and Donald Nelson. The schedule, one bomber every hour. Second stop on their tour of inspection is the assembly line of a huge tank plant. Six months ago, sleek, shiny automobiles were rolling through the grounds. Today, grim, heavy weapons of war are being readied for service at the front. In Washington, China's foreign minister, T.V. Sung, concludes a lend-lease agreement with Secretary of State Hull. China will get more and more tanks and bombers to help Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. America promises all aid to her gallant Eastern ally. On the Pacific coast, workers in a bomber plant get a visit from America's hero of the hour, General James Doolittle the man who led the first United States bombing raid on Tokyo. Addressing the men who built the ships that rained bombs on Japan, the general said, thanks for some great airplanes. America, traditionally a maritime nation, mobilizes its mechanical and its industrial genius to build the largest fleet of cargo ships ever to sail the seven seas. The method is unique in all the annals of shipbuilding. Ordering prefabricated ready-made parts from some 500 factories scattered throughout the country, the yards apply mass production technique, and the results are breaking all records. Average time to build a ship during the First World War, 11 months. Record time, seven and one half months. Now they're completing them in 46 days. Hailing the victory of production, the nation celebrates Maritime Day with a mass decoration of merchant seamen. In New York, Mayor LaGuardia awards medals to men who have been victims of Axis submarines off the Atlantic coast. There's no downing the spirits of these brave sailor men. Torpedoed two and three times, they're ready to sail again. Victory ships, they call them now. And there they go, eager for the sea. Two vessels are being delivered every day, three a day by the end of the year. Recently, in one 24-hour working day, 27 brand new ships slid down the waves. Nowhere else in all the world is such production possible. The goal for 1943, 23 million tons of shipping. No sooner is one launched than they swing a new keel into place for another. Not a minute is wasted. Workmen working night and day, seven days a week. 
to produce the ships America's enormous war effort demands. colorful Belmont Park dedicates its greatest day of racing to the Army Navy Relief Fund. 30,000 fans, including U.S. General Hugh Drum and Admiral Adolphus Andrews, head the host of servicemen here for the Big Turf Classic. The $53,000 Belmont Stakes, the nation's champion three-year-olds all the way together. nearly two million dollars for the day, the crowd now sees their favorite Al Saab running second. Shut out, the Kentucky Derby winner is in front and there to stay. No matter which one wins, America's servicemen collect the profits. That's a real sporting gesture. Military experts from 17 South and Central American nations see an impressive demonstration of the United States Great Air Training Program in action. 60,000 flyers every year. Their motors roaring defiance this graduating class of young American eagles are now ready to man the fighting ships of the Army and Navy Air Corps. More troops for the American Expeditionary Force in Australia. Armed convoys winning the game of hide and seek with enemy fleets to deliver the men and material to the land down under. Girls of the Army Nurses Corps, American women going to war fronts around the globe with the men. Here is a Japanese flyer rescued from the Pacific by an American sergeant whose own plane made a forced landing on the sea. The Jap was floating nearby in the wreckage of his Zero fighter. The sergeant took him in tow and both were picked up by a passing transport. Once ashore, the Army nurses make themselves right at home in this strange new world. At an advanced base, they take over a completely equipped hospital and dressing station. Overnight, medical and surgical facilities are established to care for the physical needs of the troops. The girls, all rated as officers and trained to rigorous Army standards, work long hours. But it's not all grim. At the local zoo, they meet Australia's famous koala bears, seldom seen outside the continent. And Mr. Kangaroo jumps at the chance to meet some pretty American girls. Always on the alert, U.S. anti-aircraft units report on the double quick to gun emplacements well camouflaged from enemy scouting planes. This coastal area has been hammered for months, suspected prelude to invasion. But the American marksmen are ready and waiting. From nearby aerodromes, United Nations pilots take to the sky in fast fighting pursuit ships. Scouring the area, these are the men who are defending the aerial approaches to Australia. And here's real action, Jap plane spotted. In a matter of seconds, the anti-aircraft crews are letting them have it. 